Hello, beautiful people. You are listening to the Communal Table Podcast, part of Food and Wine Pro. I'm your host, Kat Kinsman, and my guest today is the wonderful Julia Sullivan of Henrietta Red in Nashville. Um, when I found out that she was going to be in town cooking a dinner at Benno, uh, I really knew that I wanted to have her in because I've been hearing about her for a pretty long time from my colleagues who uh, made her a best new chef uh, a few years ago. And um, she is the captain of Food and Wines, a team for Chef Cycle. And I um, am endlessly impressed by people who can uh, do something like that uh, for such a great cause. So thank you for coming on here today, Julia. Yeah, thanks for having me. The, I am um, So talk to me about why you are in New York City today. So I am here cooking a dinner as part of a legacy series at Jonathan Benno's restaurant, Benno, on East 27th Street. Um, he was my chef at Per Se. He was the chef de cuisine there from when they opened until about 2014 um, when he moved to Lincoln, and now he has opened his own restaurant um, as part of the Evelyn Hotel. So he's doing a legacy series. There are four of us um, who are going to be here this year, including Eduardo Jordan from oh, June Baby in yes. Seattle. Um, Matt Orlando from Amas in Denmark. Incredible. Yeah, and, um, and then James... Uh, and Sandia from Bubble Dogs in London. Oh my God. I just went to Bubble Dogs <laughs> for the first time and it was the most exciting dining experience that I'd had in ages. That is so exciting. Yeah. And they just had a baby, I think, today. I saw on Instagram. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's, oh my gosh. Okay. So you just mentioned all these people, including <laughs> yourself, for whom I have tremendous esteem. So let's talk about your road to uh, to per se at this point, and then we'll we'll get on to what you're doing now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I grew up in Nashville and then went to um, college at Tulane University in New Orleans. Oh, which is sort of yeah. Is that is that distracting? <laughs> it is distracting, and I think there are uh, uh, there's a group of people who certainly should not cannot handle it <laughs> really right. um but most of us you know we were able to sort of um work hard and play hard and really and take advantage of the city and the festivals and mardi gras and that's sort of where i became interested in the business because you nashville at the time in 2001 there really actually wasn't that much going on and then you go to new orleans where these restaurants have been open for more than 100 years mm -hmm. and there's these dynasties like the brennans and there's a culture and sort of um lore that goes along with it that was just very like romantic it's they make the joke that if you pass by people on the street they're either talking about where they just had lunch or where they're going for dinner yeah <laughs> just pretty much me all the time right <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um so I studied management and finance um with the in you know interest in the restaurant business I sort of had decided that's where I wanted to uh go so I, I followed that up with um an associates at the CIA and then um, went from there to Blue Hill at Stone Barns. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So that was my first, like, big-time restaurant experience. Okay. And let's talk for a second, if I'm sure most people listening to this, if you're listening to this, you're probably familiar with, with Stone Barns. Right. But just in case, um, can you explain what that is and why it's so significant? Yeah, absolutely. So Stone Barns had, um, I think at that time, it had been open about two years also. It opened the same years, per se. Um, it was Dan Barber's second restaurant uh, in the Hudson Valley, an 84-acre organic farm that was really meant to be his next chapter, but primarily to um, be a, a center for food and agriculture um, with Stone Barns, um, where they could educate about sustainable agriculture, and they really have done quite a lot to like push heritage breeds and now mm -hmm. at this point um with they just launched a seed company where they're coming up with row seven <laughs> row seven new breeds of vegetables that are being bred for culinary uh characteristics specifically so really really innovative not just from a culinary standpoint but from an agricultural standpoint and so as a young cook was like uh, just a pretty fantastic place to be um so from there, ended up in the city at Per Se, and I was there for two years. And just like you said before, I mean, I think I was there at a very special time, 2007 to 2009, mm -hmm. um, 
was like a cross section of all these people who are now just running some of the best restaurants in the world. Um, so I feel again, I was 24 years old, very impressionable. Mm -hmm. I was working with like David Breeden from the French Laundry on one side of me and then Matt Orlando on the other side. And I was like way above my head. (laughs) It was, you know, it was amazing. The fact that you were working there in the first place, though, speaks to what you must have already shown there, because it's not like they hire slouches there. Right. Well, you know what? I met JB at um, Chef Benno at um, the CIA. Um, he was doing a demo on sous vide cooking. It was um, not like they were starting the development for um, Chef Keller's sous vide cookbook. Mm-hmm. So he was there doing a demo, and I, vol- I was a student volunteer, and we just like had a good rapport. And then I saw him again when I was still a student and asked him about coming into trail, and then um, ended up there. And actually, probably one of my only professional regrets was not staying at Stone Barns longer, Mm -hmm. but also I wouldn't change anything about going to Per Se at that time, Um, especially because he specifically has been such an incredible mentor and help to me in my career. So it was really um, at the right place at the right time. What did you learn about yourself through this? Because I'm thinking, you know, I read the memoir uh, written by the the server who worked mm-hmm. at Per Se, and it's an astonishing chronicle of the training that people go through mm-hmm. there. She was, I'm totally blanking on her name because I suck. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, service included by Phoebe Damrosh. Okay, job. there it is. Good Thank job. you. <laughs> um, and uh, it's, it's a wonderful book, but talking about the sort of calibration of service that happens there, talking about taking movement training talking about you know dealing with with guests in in a particular way every single movement seems uh prescribed scripted i mean there's a there's a flow to it but it it seems like there's such a precision Mm -hmm. to it um can you talk about going into something like that How, how how does that affect your psyche Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's not, the kitchen is not that different from the dining room in that restaurant. Like everything is very, very choreographed. And, and I think. Choreographed, that's a great word. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. And I think on a, on a great night, especially with Chef Benno at the pass, it felt like a really great football game. You know, somebody's like calling orders and everything's in sync and the timing is correct. And, and then on really hard nights, it Mm -hmm. felt really, really awful. Oh God. (laughs) Um, And you hated to be like responsible for any part of that. Um, I think it was really, um, you know, not not that many kitchens like that exist. And I think when you're in it, you sort of think that everyone else is the outlier and then you get out of it and you realize, no, actually, that was the outlier. Um, it can be very intense. Yeah. Well, and what's the emotional tenor of that? Like, I, I'm, I'm thinking, like, there are kitchens that you see where it's just head down, we chef. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't an aggressive place, but it was definitely a very hyper-focused place. I mean, we didn't talk, we didn't play music, um, we did yell back. Um, I have, you know, trouble getting my cooks to call back to me now, and (laughs) there it's just like this automatic. Um, It was, yeah, it can be very intense because everything is about sense of urgency um no movement wasted and so and and you're changing a nine course tasting menu every day so yeah yeah, so you start your day basically with nothing and then you have five hours to to prep it all perfectly beautifully from scratch you know (laughs) and then and then be in service for six hours so it was it's a lot how do you take care of yourself during at that point? Uh, how did you take care of your your physical and mental self? Well, I think so. I have always been, you know, an athlete in high school. I ran track and field and cross country and just always stayed in shape. So I was very good about exercising, which, you know, I think for me, it was very it was like my alone time, sort of its own meditation, like um really helped me stay focused and burn off nervous energy. Um, so I think that was a very good habit. The, th- the things I, um, the things that are challenging are that you just don't, there's just isn't a lot of time for self-care. Mm-hmm. There's not a, t- a lot of time for sleep or recovery. So you end up spending a lot of your, your two days off um, uh, sleeping. So there's not a ton of room for, um, family or, um, 
or really anything outside of it. And I think there's really something to be said for that to a degree in your formative years of having that kind of discipline and commitment to something. Um, and I think it's probably a little bit different now, you know, just, I think the last few years there's been a really palpable change in yeah. restaurants and restaurant culture. And frankly, like a lot of people getting sober, a lot of right. people taking up, uh, you know, group exercise challenges. Right. And I think a lot of people, I, I hear from a lot of restaurateurs that they are having a hard time hiring people because people see now, because people are speaking out about it, the conditions in a kitchen thing and like, screw that. I don't want to do that to yeah. my life, to my body, <clears throat> to, you know, my chance of having a family, to, uh, you know, having meaningful relationships with right. people. Right. Yeah. I mean, you certainly have to consider priorities and, um, I think one thing that I grapple with a little bit now as a restaurant owner is that the amount of work that it takes to run a 100 seat restaurant, wow. you know, there's all these positive changes yeah. in the industry and, you know, we want to pay people more and give people more time off, but at the actual amount of work that it takes to run the restaurant hasn't changed. And so that's a difficult thing with an owner or for an owner, I think, to, to reconcile because if you take a lot of that weight off of your hourly staff, you tend to place a lot of that on yourself, on your managers. Yes. And and it is it's I still don't think we've quite figured out. Like someone needs to shift the <laughs> paradigm, but there's yeah. a reason it's been the same for as long as it has, I think. Yeah, I, it's it's interesting. I you know, I, I spend a lot of time talking to 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 chefs from right. all over the world. And trying to figure out the, the, the small things that they have, mm -hmm. have done to better work-life balance, to have a better physical self in the kitchen, to encourage talk around mental health. And I see it being done piecemeal in mm -hmm. some really smart and thoughtful kind of ways. You know, some of the restaurants in, in Copenhagen, they'll decide, like, we're just going to be open for fewer, mm -hmm. uh, you know, fewer days. Yes. And or some, you know, or they pass the cost of things along to consumers right. along with pretty open language about where to do it. Or, you know, they offer, uh, you know, sort of after after work running or something yeah. like that. But I don't know if anybody's cracked the, the case I know. quite yet. And that's the, s the struggle. You know, I keep coming back to use the word choreography that you saw me like seize on like yeah. that. Um, I had another friend, uh, Kate Barney, mm -hmm. who that's she's Kate. really a beautiful, wonderful human being who uh, was working at Stone Barns when um, I had gone for a fairly significant dinner. It was actually the uh, 10 year anniversary of my first date with my husband. Mm -hmm. But we, uh, we, um, he got my husband got ordained and married a couple of friends of ours in the grain silo there, which was really really yeah. special, and she was part of the choreography of of the whole night. But I, it was funny; I was watching them round the dining room, and I sort of got to know their little like almost baseball signals yes. to each yeah. other. Um, and you become part of such an entity. Mm -hmm. How do you detach self from that when you're used to being part of, you know, whether a front of house team in the kitchen? there is this unity of movement. When we walked through the kitchen from this grain silo where there were just the four of us and they knew that, you know, they, our friends had gotten married, everybody stopped for a moment and banged on pots and pans yeah. and it was the most yeah. beautiful thing in the world. But it felt like an entity. How do you take yourself from being, you know, a kitchen that's like that and, and be a person separate from like that? When you go home, how do mm -hmm. you be a person? I think it's tough. I'm trying to, especially at that age, I think it's tough. Um, and I think, you know, when you are an ambitious, you know, when you're trying to learn everything you can in that time and space and, and push yourself to grow, I think it can be difficult. I think young people now, at least that I'm seeing in Nashville, have better boundaries about it. Um, but, yeah, I do think it is. I think, I think making the time like I said on your days off to stay connected to friends and family is really important because if you're constantly surrounded by people from the restaurant and industry people it is easy to sort of lose yourself a little bit mm -hmm. um being back in Nashville has been great for me because you know I'm in my 30s and I have um family there and nieces and nephews and also aging parents and mm -hmm. it's hard for me as an owner I think to to step away and say you know what somebody needs me today and I'm gonna go do that but I'm getting better at it um it takes two practice. years in it's yeah. so really yeah. hard you know I 
you know, I see my husband as a, as a boss at work and, you know, he, bef- before his current job had had, uh, you know, his, his own company and put himself last all mm-hmm. the time yeah. at, at like a, you know, and I see him doing all of the jobs, you know. Right. And it's not, I don't think it's only hard for the reasons that are so obvious, but it's also hard because there's, there's a little bit of an aftermath. Like whenever I say, you know what, I'm just going to take a day or I'm going to take this vacation. There's, there's like, for me at least, like guilt associated yeah. with that. <laughs> and that's kind of the hardest part is how it. hard I am on myself. Oh man, I grew up uh, Catholic school, 12, <laughs> 12 years and, you know, all, all of that. And it's been a really, it's a really, really hard thing. Uh, I think especially for people who go into restaurants because it, there's a meticulousness of people who go into the kitchen. And I, I know that a lot of people are drawn to kitchen life because it, it's there, there is this precision to it. And there's this mental math mm-hmm. that goes on all the time. Like when you, when you go home, did I wrap that thing? Right. Yeah. Did I shut this? Did I, you know, did I do this thing, this thing, this thing? And it probably takes everything you're being not to drive back to the restaurant. Right. Exactly. Um, and, and shutting down that, that part that says, let it burn. Mm-hmm. You know, that's got to be such a difficult thing to do. Yeah, it is. But I think to, you know, um, building a a really responsible, committed, trustworthy management team yes. and rewarding them so that, you know, you can step away, whether it's for a professional trip or for a personal reason. Um, that is huge, huge, huge. It's, yeah. Let, well, let's talk about then, um, and we'll get to that. But let's talk about your your road back to Nashville mm-hmm. and to becoming an owner because you know it's it's I know how hard it is to get financing mm-hmm. for such a thing, and you know even more so for women. Yeah, I I know it's got to be. Let's talk about how you made the decision to first of all go go back to where you're from and to take this thing on uh, to to open a restaurant. That is a masochistic thing to do (laughs) yeah well I think you know I think what drives people to open restaurants is probably different for everyone but my reason I think is more that I feel deeply entrepreneurial and wanting to work for myself and have a small business Um, and cooking just happened to be what I was good at and fell into and had experience with Um, and so um, the business side of it is sort of as interesting to me as the cooking side. And I often tell people if I was like purely about the cuisine, I probably, I might still be in New York, you know, at the helm of someone else's restaurant. Um, And some, I feel guilt about that sometimes (laughs) that I'm not only about the cuisine, but I really do love being a restaurateur. Um, So for me, the road back to Nashville was that I had wanted sort of since I was a student at Tulane had always wanted to open a restaurant. That was it. And, um, at the time, you know, in 2001, Margo McCormick opened Margo in East Nashville. She was just on the long list, um, for James Beer for outstanding chef this year. Um, yeah. And she's been doing her thing in Nashville for 17 years and, um, she's a native as well. And, and so I always really look to her as kind of the model for this like small quaint space and a small business, um, that was really making a big impression. Um, and you know, Nashville sort of grew slowly and surely from there and really didn't start to like pop off until like the last five to 10 years. It's batty. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. So, so I sort of saw myself as a Margo and wanted to go back and then right about the time that I started to seriously think about it and write a business plan was like, you know, 2011, 2012, when like you start sort of started to see the city everywhere you know Mm -hmm. it was getting great PR and there was like some interesting chefs starting to move down that way um so I um made the decision I said so actually I I took a job working for um Haven's Kitchen on West 17th Street so yeah so I was the opening chef there and um luckily got into the project on at a time when we were still in the architect's office, you know, construction design. And so I saw like many pre-opening stages and I think said, you know what, I am, I can do this. I'm ready to do this. Um, and so I, I moved back home and started putting plans together. Um, a colleague of mine from Haven's Kitchen actually ended up moving with me to be my general manager. She's a sommelier there as well. Well, for, uh, for me, um, with me. And so we, we were working on the business plan, sort of pounding the pavement. 
And in the meantime, um, we both took other jobs. She was serving at an Italian restaurant um, for one restaurant group in town, and I was an opening sous chef at a restaurant called Pinewood Social with um, the folks from Strategic Hospitality and Josh Habiger, who's now at Bastion. Um, And that was a really tough opening. It was a 200-seat-plus restaurant with a bowling alley and at a time when the city was just starting to boom. And we ambitious as heck. Oh, my gosh. But I don't even think they realized how ambitious. Mm -hmm. Like, I think they thought... People would be hanging out and bowling and drinking cocktails, and all of a sudden we were doing 600 covers on a Saturday night and and just getting crushed by bachelorette parties. Oh, because <laughs> yeah, it is a bachelorette destination. <laughs> it is. True, true. <laughs> and so I think everyone involved, Josh and I and other sous chefs, we were sort of, um, frankly, hadn't done that volume before, and, and it was tough. It was really tough. And meanwhile, I'd go home, and I was up late every night sort of working on what was next for mm-hmm. me and Allie, my partner. Um, and the fundraising was really hard. It was really, really hard. We emailed, spoke to everyone we knew, asked who they could introduce us to. Um, we got a few yeses, mostly from, um, close friends and family. Um, we got a few sort of dangling carrots from some old, um, chefs and colleagues and, Mostly we got a lot of maybes, which I learned is like the worst possible thing to get. Because like, you're just there on tender hooks. Yeah. And... So you want like the our I the biggest lesson I learned is like get people to say no because you don't want to, them to like be hanging on, you know, to That's leave so you. It's so stressful. It's really stressful because you don't really ever know when to close the door. You're like, should I email them? Should I not? Some of them are friends or friends, you know, parents of friends or colleagues and it just gets very awkward at some <laughs> yeah. point. So yes or no, but eventually we hit a wall and we went to um, Ben Goldberg, who is the owner of Pinewood and, um, and was my friend in high school and um, him and his brother. Yeah. (laughs) So him and his brother um, are the owners of strategic hospitality. Um, I had been in school with one of them since first grade and I went to his older brother, Ben, and I said, you know, I've really hit a wall. I'm not going to pitch you on this. I don't want to be part of a restaurant group, but like, can you introduce me to 10 people? Could you give me some advice? And he said, let me give some thought. And ended up coming back six or eight weeks later and saying, you know, we actually have a great space that we can see this working out there. Um, What if we did this together? And there was a lot of hesitation. It wasn't like, rejoice you know moment of rejoice there was a lot of hesitation on my part because I'd always envisioned myself doing it in in with investors on yeah exactly um on my own sort of and so there was a lot of back and forth and it was still a long drawn out process but at the end of the day we really Allie and I really um fought for what we believed in and held on to what we thought was important and it's um we opened in february of 2017 and it's been like an overwhelmingly positive experience and you uh <coughs> were a food and wine best new chef food so and wine best new chef just last year that's <laughs> yeah <laughs> and we are at the time we're recording this uh, a week from tomorrow the 2019 class will be revealed really that soon this soon wow, it's that's such so exciting. oh it's such a special group of people and we are um you know, we're a thing that we have thought about and that I will ask you now is what can we ask of past best new chefs? What what did they learn along the way? What did they pick up from the sudden scrutiny mm-hmm. of that? Because it, it really is uh, it's all of a sudden like standing in in the flood uh, floodlight. Yes, it is. Um, I think, you know, it was a pretty overall positive experience I mean I really can't say enough about the exposure it gives you um also the connections just with Mm -hmm. your classmates and um it's been really really special to get to know this group of 10 chefs from around the country um and you were the 30th group I believe yeah 30th anniversary which was amazing um and you're looking back at people like Thomas Keller and Danielle I think were the first year yeah that was they were super early on yeah so it's a very special thing to be a part of. Um, uh, I think, I think just sort of making sure that the home fire is burning, you know, the restaurant has to be the first priority. Um, you're going to get asked to do a million things. And I think really prioritizing a 
the stuff that's important to you, like for instance, you know, if if your mentor Jonathan Benno calls you and wants you to come to New York, say yes. <laughs> yeah. Right. But then if if there's if there's something that is you know just not that near and dear to your heart, um, it's okay to say no because there's going to be more. That's that is such a huge lesson to learn whether you're a chef or, or whether, anybody. Yeah, yeah, it's such a hard thing. We actually do have um, a couple of PR people coming in to talk to the chefs about what is worth your time. Right. Mm-hmm. People ask, and I don't know if the public knows this necessarily. Chefs are asked constantly Constantly. for things and it's so much of it is great it's it's for charity it's for you know this event that event Uh, can you do this can you do this and i how many requests a day do you get for things like that i mean the restaurant definitely gets at least two or three a day um just from hey we're from this organization this organization as small as can you donate a gift card to can you do this dinner in another state and um And, of course, there's only so many days in the year. So a lot of it you just have to say no to outright because it's a conflict or whatever. But you have to keep a lot of things in mind, like your personal health, the things that are important to you, but also your team and Mm -hmm. and how you're going to lead. And it doesn't really work if you're gone every weekend, you know. And and so I think you have to really, like, prioritize. I, yeah, I definitely get that because it seems like, you know, you have this moment and you think, oh, I have to make the most of this and do mm-hmm. say yes to absolutely everything. And then right. you end up costing yourself your, your physical and emotional and, your and personal mental life. Yeah. It's, it's really uh, tough to do that. So you went into business with um, people who you already knew yes. and liked. Um, that's something that we're actually going to be talking with the best new chefs about too, mm-hmm. like who to go into right. business with and how you um, maintain that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we're, we're like bringing in, um, Jonathan and Amelia Sawyer to talk about, and he was the best new chef mm-hmm. <laughs> some years back, how you maintain a marriage while you do that, right. how you maintain, um, any of these things I see, you know, chefs trying to mm-hmm. date or go to family events or to see their friends every once in a while. And mm-hmm. it's, it's t- how, how do you maintain any kind of relationship? Um, whether it's somebody inside the restaurant bubble or outside of it, it's very, tough I mean with from the family standpoint I am very lucky my family is so supportive and they sort of understand that if I'm not at home I'm pretty much at the restaurant and so they come to me you know they come in for happy hour they bring their friends Mm. in and yeah it's great it's It's, lovely it's a really nice reason to be home I mean and I'll just on that note Nashville (coughs) excuse me Nashville is so supportive we there's not a night that goes by that we don't look out into the dining room and see somebody we know whether it's like a high school principal a friend a you know teacher an old chef um you know and that is really really special and it really makes you feel like people are showing up and supporting you which we love my parents are great about very supportive um siblings so that helps but i do try and get away because you know aging parents, siblings with children, you just really have to, um, it's, it's tough. You have to sort of start to make that a priority. Um, personal life, I'm terrible at. <laughs> I'll just be honest. That's all, I mean, I'm I, terrible I, you at. You know what? I think that's important to say. It's yeah. important to, to talk about because, you know, it's it's a thing that happens with, uh, you know, front of house, back of house. Like, you get out at crazy ass mm-hmm. hours. And it's, uh, you know, there aren't a lot of people who can understand that, like, that restaurant comes first for right. you as an, as an owner. It's... <laughs> And not for your own personal gains, but for, like, the livelihood of the 50 people working for you, too. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I wish I had better advice about it. Um, I've, like, dated people in the industry, not in the industry, and I think there's challenges to both. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I think I'm trying to make more space for it. Yeah. I mean, most people I, I, I know who, um, you know, have a partner in the – they're both in the industry, and that's because it's the other person who, who gets it. But, you know, I also know a few successful couples who they don't, and they just sort of had to make rules for their relationship. Right. About how, how do we, do, we right. do this? I'm going to come home, and I'm going to wake you up. I'm going right. to – you know, whatever it happens to be. But I, I think it's important to say this stuff out loud so people know what they're, they're getting yeah, into, and there's no absolutely. shame in it. Absolutely. I think, um, you know, Josh said something which I think is important. He got married um, around the time that Bastion opened, and he said, 
when I'm not at the restaurant, you know, Laura knows the restaurant is my priority. And when I'm not at the restaurant, she is number one and that's it. Like I make the time. And, and I think that's what I'm learning in a new relationship is, is it's more about quality, not quantity necessarily. Oh, absolutely. Making yeah. the most of that, that time. And, right. Um, I know uh, there seems to be a lot of chefs who have animals too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, those, uh, and I, I've mentioned this on the podcast before, but about like people who have made some way to have the animal at the restaurant, like so. are there, like it's a little dog house out back or something, <laughs> because it, se- it seems to be really good emotional care for the team to be yeah. able to like walk out and pet a puppy. I actually, it just occurred to me. I was in Austin recently at a restaurant. I won't name because uh, one of the cooks did this. Um, he knew the couple of people I was with and he walked out with a bag and said, want to pet a dirty puppy? <laughs> I'm like, hell yeah, I want to pet your dirty puppy. <laughs> but it was, it was such a nice thing, I think, for morale for the people who were working there, too. Yeah, our kitchen is big on dogs. We don't have any at the restaurant, but most most of us have one. And I go home during family meal to walk my dog. Aww. And it is a big, you know, it's not convenient, but it is a big source of comfort for me. So I definitely, I'm not getting rid of it anytime soon. Tell me about your dog. Uh, he's a mutt. He's a little terrier, some sort of terrier. Um, he's not very well behaved (laughs) he's fiercely loyal and um i um yeah i love him but what's his name his name is wrigley Wrigley. and so this is actually and i think kind of an important thing to say out loud too is i actually share him with an ex and we are very good about keeping a schedule and people think it's like crazy but if you're a single person with a busy work schedule it's so nice to have another person who actually takes responsibility and yeah. they can watch it when you're out of town etc cetera, etc cetera. so it actually works really well i think that's lovely yeah it's I, nice i think that's i think that sounds like a very mature responsible adult thing to do yeah, so. um kelly fields we recorded with with her and again i never know what order these are airing in mm-hmm. but talked about the effect of getting a dog on her mental health and saying mm-hmm. that was the best possible thing oh, yeah, that she could have done and it and it I always think like as, you know, I am very open about the fact that I have anxiety and Mm -hmm. all these things. um, I tell myself that the single best use of my time is making my dogs feel safe Mm -hmm. and calm. And and, um, especially I have this little girl dog, Penelope. I have uh, two of them, but she in particular like rolls over and gives me her belly. Mm -hmm. And I think like I'm making her feel (laughs) safe and secure. And it's just the most calming thing in the world and I'm making her calm and I feel good about it it's really nice too it gets you out of your home and I I bet in a city like New York especially but when you know I you know going on walks every morning and every staff meal um getting to know your neighborhood and your neighbors in a way that you wouldn't otherwise um just and just having that 30 minutes in the morning where you can just be silent with the dog or you can put on a meditation podcast and like reset yourself for the day like i really think it it's that thing especially for a single person that m- forces you to make a little time and space that's not just about you not just about the restaurant um so for me it's been great and then that sounds like a like wonderful thing to do for yourself and how do you how do you communicate to your team that they should be taking care of themselves as well? We make a point to... And who's the we here? um, I say we a lot when I'm talking about myself. (laughs) (laughs) And and the restaurant, the royal we, you know, but (laughs) Allie and I, we, Allie, my partner and I, we we do make a point to, um, especially when there's, you know, events in the industry that we feel like are significant, you know, in the last couple of years with suicide or yeah. or sexual harassment, et cetera, et cetera, to stop and really acknowledge it and talk about it and remind people that we have their backs if they need it. Um, I think for the most part, our staff actually feels really comfortable speaking to us, approaching us about personal problems. Um, and we try very hard um, to, to be accessible. Um, it's... You know, it's not always, it's not like there's daily reminders, but, you know, we try to do small things like we do offer um, benefits. We That's make, not a small thing. <laughs> yeah. That's a huge thing. Yeah. We, we may offer a staff meal every day and we try to make sure it's always balanced and healthy. You know, another sort of takeaway from fine dining. Um, but we, we, I think just acknowledging that, 
that these things happen and, and we're here and, and, um, and, you know, if you, you're noticing someone struggling physically or emotionally to just pull them aside for a second. Um, you know, I can't say we've, we've, we're perfect, but I think we, our, our, our restaurant to me really feels like a family. We've been open a little over two years and especially in the front of house have had such a small amount of turnover. Oh, that's huge. Yeah. And it's, it's really makes, um, it really makes a difference, I think, in the overall tone of the space. So let's talk about what that conversation looks like, because I, I, I talk to a lot of uh, chefs, restaurant owners, front of house people who they know that they want to start really talking with their staffs in, in this particular way and really acknowledging them. I mean, they appreciate them and everything, but even more as as humans and acknowledging the stresses in the industry in a real impalpable way, because there are so many suicides, Mm -hmm. overdoses, stressors of all different kinds. And they say like, okay, but you know, we haven't talked about this before. How, how do we start? Yeah, I think, um, well, first off, we just don't really have like a drinking or drug culture. Like I don't go out with my staff after work and, and I'll, I'll buy people a round of beers if we have like a really challenging night and they just do a great job or we um, have a guest chef in and we want to take a moment to sort of say cheers, but like, it's not something we do or encourage or participate in really. Um, But I, I think, um, yeah, I think just realizing that you have to get outside of your comfort zone because you are responsible for some extent to these for these people's livelihoods. Um, it's not it's not comfortable to get up at a staff lineup and say, "Hey, did you hear about what happened last night?" Um, and and it feels you know to bring it up like that in some ways can feel almost like like mandatory or or like you're not doing enough. Um, but I think it like just, you have to get over, get past yourself and your own discomfort and just bring attention to it. So they feel comfortable if they need the help. I think, I, I think we as a culture aren't great with awkwardness. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, and, and chefs are in the back of the house for a reason right. a lot of the time because people don't, you know, they don't necessarily want to go and, you know, they're obviously love what they do, but they don't necessarily want to go and interact with the, with the diners. And, mm-hmm. um, so many people that I've found gravitate to the kitchen because like maybe they weren't suited to something else. They maybe weren't brought up with a vocabulary for, talking about their feelings mm-hmm. it's because you, you know you're valued for a, in a completely different way in the kitchens and right. having to coax those conver those conversations can be a really difficult thing I mean I always just say you know I, I think you know because I struggle with my own mental health and think about how people have approached me and it's just like hey how are you doing uh, you know yeah. kind of thing sometimes or just a, a gift that a friend sort of gave to me was the language of no need to respond right I'm here if you know if you need that right and I think too something I I think about you sometimes is I you know I'm 35 I see a therapist and I think acknowledging yeah Mm -hmm. acknowledging that in front of your 23 and 24 year old staff members is important it's like this stuff shouldn't be so taboo to talk about it and like I don't necessarily go because I struggle with x y and z I go to just have like somebody who I can check in with who knows the baseline so that if I do start to feel really uncomfortable about something or I have a significant life event that there's someone there to turn to that's not my mom or my Mm -hmm. business partner or and so just to just to say those things openly even though I feel really healthy and and good um to normalize it a little bit yes like step away from normalizing drinking and normalize mental health is like (gasps) I agree yeah well I I remember um there was uh, there there was an old show it's old even when I was young called my three sons Mm -hmm. and they somebody on the on the show made it was like Fred McMurray said something about needing to see a psychiatrist I didn't know what the word meant and Mm -hmm. I went in and said to my mother like hey what's a psychiatrist and she froze and said don't ever tell anybody that mommy sees a psychiatrist. Yeah. I'm like, what? Like, I don't even know what that means. Like, cause I, you know, I, I didn't know what it was. And to go from that to like, 
you know, I, you know, saying like, oh, you know, I'm going to be off talking to my to my shrink for a minute. Or, right. You know, is is a really huge thing. But even that even happened to me at work once. I said I was leaving to go to therapy, and my boss kind of froze up, and I was like. What the hell, man? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's important. I know. I'll occasionally go to a, walk into a team meeting, you know, and looking like I've been crying. And I'm like, oh, don't worry. I was just, <laughs> I was just in therapy. I'm fine. I'm I, totally fine. I know. I, I like, I crack a lot of jokes about it too, but I still think it's important to really bring it up. Mm-hmm. And so it, it's so great. Like, yay, therapy. I'm always uh, like, I, I am so pro therapy. I also realize that it's an incredibly difficult hurdle for people who don't necessarily have the money or the access to yep. it, or maybe come from a culture where it's taboo to mm-hmm. do these things. Um, and how, how do you, uh, what do you say if somebody uh, comes to you and says like, Hey, you know, I think I do need help. How do you, how do you get them to that point? I don't know that it's happened to us in that context, but I think, um, you know, because of the events of the last couple of years, some organizations are doing a really good job of bringing attention to the resources that do exist if you don't have, um, let's say, funds or um, proximity or what have you, you know, different helplines or or even now there's like online resources. Oh, crisis text line, which I always shout out. It's you can text 741741 day or night. And there's somebody there who's a trained volunteer who will text back with you and have this conversation and it's free. Right. And I think, you know, too, I think people, people, you know, this is interesting. Our chef de cuisine at Stone Barns, um, who's back in Israel now, was really wonderful. But one of the things he always said to us was like, if somebody, this is very much in a cooking context, but he said always, like, if somebody comes to you and they're saying, hey, man, I'm not going to be set up on time. Can you help me with this? Even if you're in the weeds, like, stop what you're doing and help them do it because it will just, like, clear the air, stop them from spinning, and mm-hmm. then, like, hopefully everybody gets the service set up. And I think as a manager, owner, it's, like, a completely different context, whereas if, if an employee comes to you and says, hey, I really need to talk do you have 30 minutes or can you meet me at a coffee shop down the street? Cause I really need to talk about this. Um, just taking the time to be present for them, I think goes a long way. It really does. Having somebody who gives a crap and is not going to punish you. Right. I mean, and that's actually it. That's a tone you set from the top Mm -hmm. to let them know from the get go that it is safe to do this with you and they don't have to worry uh, about that. I mean, I always say like, that showing your vulnerability is actually a really huge strength. So Right. And and also to mention that like I'm certainly not perfect and we all make mistakes. We work in in a very high intensity environment where sometimes we do yell and sometimes um we do lose our cool or start to cry or whatever. And I think I think if you know that you've crossed a line to then take the time to process it and and just make an apology about it you know apologies sincere apologies go so far right it's an art that uh you know i think we're getting more and more in tune with as uh you know public conversations about things uh, you know come through whether it's you know me too whether it's missteps in the restaurant industry and like there's a lot to be said for just stepping up and saying i screwed up i'm sorry yeah you know and we're i guess we're all taught as kids they're sorry (laughs) not always to mean it right right i mean it seems like you do tremendous caretaking for the people around you for your for your team and and you're doing this tremendous physical thing i i am so gobsmacked by this thing that you're doing with um with the the chef cycle yeah. thing can you talk about this how you got started in it exactly what it is and where the money goes to what right. the training looks like yeah well like i said i've always been kind of into um endurance athletics i um i was a runner for a long time i started cycling in part because i was still in new york and started riding a bike to get around the city and then so when i moved back to nashville i did some triathlons and Um, and, but cycling gravitated towards it more and more because I'm so used to standing on my feet for 14 hours a day. Like it's not the most appealing thing in the world to go for a 10 mile run anymore. (laughs) Um, your poor knees. Right. Exactly. So, um, so I had seen chef cycle and been interested in it and, um, thought about doing it two years ago, but it sort of coincided with our restaurant opening. 
So last year signed up, um, basically it is a 300 mile bike ride. You do three consecutive 100 mile rides in Santa Rosa, in and around Santa Rosa, California, um, with 250 other um, industry folks that are industry adjacent. So it's not just chefs. There's people from William Sonoma, people from Open Table. Um, Editor in chief of Food and Wine, Hunter yeah, Lewis. Hunter Lewis, uh, our, Food and Wine our, uh, you know, our, our f- wonderful food editor, Mary Frances Heck. Yeah, absolutely. So, oh, and and I know Bon Appetit has had a team before. Um, so it's a lot of really um, food adjacent people who are. Um, concerned about hunger issues in the United States. And so um, Chef Cycle raises money for No Kid Hungry, which is part of Share Our Strength. And they uh, raise money to bring awareness to policy change around um, providing breakfast and lunch for kids in schools, providing education for families about feeding your family uh, resources. And so um, it is a national organization, and Chef Cycle brings in all these people to taps into the chef community to raise money uh, up until the ride, and then we all ride together. And it's such a it's such a great thing. I think tapping into the chef community first of all oh, is yeah. so smart. So oh, it's such a enthusiastic. Oh, oh yeah, I, I well, and there's also a sort of a tie that I see increasingly. It's the chefs who um, have embraced sobriety still have that sort of need to fill to do something. And I've seen (laughs) so many chefs sort of quit drugs and alcohol and become obsessive cyclists. Yes. And, and just um, passionate activists. And so there's, I think chefs are so, we we all have our own venue. We all have our own platform to fundraise. So um, good on share our strength for getting on that (laughs) early because now, you know, it's, it's a group of people who can say, hey, let me partner with you and we'll have a dinner at my restaurant and we'll take those funds and we'll um, give them to this cause. So for this year, um, I am riding with Team Food and Wine with Hunter and Mary Frances and some other chefs, Brady Williams, who's a Best New Chef as well last year. Um, so we've had Brady to the restaurant to cook. We've had Josh Haviger. We've had Kate Williams from Detroit. And we're also doing some um, like wellness-based activities too. So we did a yoga class. We have a um, cycling class coming up and a, an outdoor ride for more community based. Um, so it's, yeah, it's really fun. It's a really a great opportunity to engage. The training is intense. The fundraising <laughs> is intense. Um, but it's a great cause and it's a lot of fun. I can't help you with the training, but mm-hmm. you, we were, she was saying before this happened that, uh, you know, the fundraising is awkward asking people for money. So I'm going to do it for yeah. you. So if say someone wanted to contribute to, uh, your particular ride, Mm -hmm. where would they go to do that? You can go to chefcycle.org and then you can search all of the people riding. So you can type in my name or Hunter's name and go straight to our personal fundraising page and uh, donate there. And anything that you give to someone on the Team Food and Wine will go to our collective fundraising, which I think our overall goal um, is to hit 60,000. We're about halfway there. Whoa. Yeah. And then in that is incredible. Mm-hmm. And then in total, this whole ride raises, it's got to be over 2 million every year. Yeah. That is magnificent. Yeah. And, um, and shout out to uh, Billy Shore. Yeah. Who is behind Share Our Strength and all these different initiatives. They also do No Kid Hungry. Right. Um, it's actually really great. I order from, from Seamless of mm-hmm. more than I should. Uh, <laughs> I do cook, but I order from Seamless a lot. And there's this great thing where you can round up your donation mm-hmm. and it's been for No Kids Hungry or it's been for James Beard's, uh, awesome. you know, women in leadership kind of things. And it's just a very passive way <laughs> to right. give your money yeah, over for this. Great. How do you find the time to train for this? It's tough, um, especially in winter. That's the oh, one thing wow, about yeah. the May ride is you're sort of overwintering, which is hard. Um, I do a lot of spin classes, which they actually don't recommend. <laughs> but it's <laughs> so hard to get out on a bike when it's less than 50 degrees outside. Um, uh, I think really just setting aside the time in the morning um, to – you know, devote even an hour to yourself to to the training is really all it takes. I mean, you have to towards as you approach the race, you really have to block out some time to do these, you know, four hour rides, which you really have to do to make sure you're not only physically there, but mentally there because it's a lot of hours on the bike. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's definitely a commitment. You 
you certainly falter. But the nice thing is you have about six months leading up to it. So even if you fall behind at times or you have a lot of travel here and there, like you can usually have time to make up for it. What do you listen to while you're doing this? I listen to um, a lot of podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> I listen to uh, NPR. I have like an embarrassing, my most listened to songs of 2018 on Spotify, which is like any, everything from like Despacito to, um, you know, Florence and the Machines, kind of uh, terrible. But it's, um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of hours you have to fill. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And just, I mean, that's kind of wonderful, though, to be able to be doing this incredible physical thing and fill in your mind at mm-hmm. the, the same time and have all this money go, go toward a tremendous cause. Yeah, it is. It's a lot of fun. Wow. And then you also get to commune with your peers mm-hmm. in a really intense and amazing level. So this ride takes place, you said 300 mile uh, rides. Are those consecutive days? Consecutive days. So we're based out of the same hotel in Santa Rosa and we do um, one ride through wine country. We do one ride over to the coast where we sort of um, race past Hog Island oysters really fast. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, so it's, everything's in that area. And um, this year it is May 14th through 16th. Um, and yeah, just boom, boom, boom. Yeah, I'll make sure that we get this podcast up beforehand because I want Team Food and Wine to kick so much financial <laughs> ass on this yeah. thing. So, you know, I've talked to Hunter some about it, and I know what he is is putting into it, and uh, and Mary Francis as well. And I just, yeah, I, I think it's an incredible thing. Chefs are the most generous souls, I have to say. Well, I think that's a lot of, you know, being like the title of your show. You know, it's like yeah. all, we're all around this table. It's all about nurturing. That's the kind of background we come from. So I think. Um, um, giving and sharing, we try to do as much as we can, generally speaking. And what is the meal that you all eat at the end of this? Is there a Ooh. ritual kind of thing? Well, they have a post-race celebration, but um, I've actually been emailing this week with our team about we're going to make a big reservation at the Charter Oak uh, <gasps> Katiana Hong's restaurant. Oh, that, yes. Yeah, and just... have like a big dinner. <laughs> oh, I've heard such amazing things about that place. It's incredible, yeah. Oh my gosh. And and you just feed nutrients into yourself. Yeah. I mean, how do you even, I, I, th- these are just questions from a person who who has never ridden a bike more than like over very long time. Those nights between like the first night and the second night and the second night and the the third night, what is that even like? How tired are you when you get to bed? You're tired. Yeah. I mean the, the, the hundred miles a day, it takes any, I mean, it takes people like Seamus Mullen, like four hours. Let's be honest. He's, he's a (laughs) machine, but, um, you know, it would take, takes me, I think depending on the terrain each day, maybe between five and eight. And so, um, so the great thing about No Get Hungry, the people administering the race, is they have it on lockdown. Like every 20 miles, there's an aid station, there's snacks, there's you know peanut butter and bananas. So you're you're replenishing those calories throughout the whole ride, hydrating constantly, um, and then you get back to the hotel and they have um, you know they have people there doing massages there's a pool there's dinner and then everybody's really like turned in by eight o'clock because <laughs> you're right back up at, you know taking off at 6 a.m the next morning oh my gosh i am so grateful that you're doing this yeah and, it's a lot of fun um i don't know if you, you say you listen to a lot of podcasts you listen to jonathan van ness's podcast i haven't yet no. oh so worth your time okay. and there is a thing that he he does because i got in the wrap it up single <laughs> uh, signal from our producer but he asks um he said it's like yoga class at the end that where they sort of ask like, what do you wish we'd done that we mm. haven't done? Is there something, a, a topic that you want to talk about that we haven't covered or a message that you want to put out there? Oh gosh. Um, I don't know. I think, um, just keeping in the vein of, of, I think, you, you know, one thing, I've mentioned the dinner and Chef Benno a lot, but yeah. but something that came up with Best New Chefs last year was um, the idea of mentorship. Yes, let's talk about that. Yeah, I think um, some of I think some of us feel very lucky to have those people that we look up to, and he's one of them for me. Mm-hmm. You know, he is a very professional guy and taught me a lot about professionalism, taught me the importance of a healthy staff meal, um, but then also just um, about food. And... And I think that um, as professionals, it's really important for us to, um, another reason it's really just important to be open to our staff and accessible to our staff is that, yeah, it's sure it might be about mental health or X, Y, and Z, but also just 
um, professionalism and leadership in our industry, and and it's booming. But if we don't have the people to matriculate and be the next generation of best new chefs, then like we're gonna, it's not gonna sustain itself. So, I am so excited about this class that's coming up, and it's really. It becomes a family, the sort of family of, of yeah. uh, best new chefs that I, I I was looking through the roster recently and thinking, look at all this talent who we have to tap. So right. we ask a lot of you, mm-hmm. I think, with this, but hopefully we're going to be able to give it to the next generation with yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. So I have a question. Th- there, there's a speed round after this, mm-hmm. but um, there's a question that I, I ask. Um, so the... Oprah moment because you know she talked about using the secret and I believe in saying out to the universe a thing that you want Uh, because you you are doing so much for the up and coming people for the people around you and for your consumers and all of all of this um what is something you want for yourself Ooh, I mean I am I truly believe I'm like a very powerful professional um manifester and part of that might just be a lot of hard work (laughs) um but I think I really do think like that balance like not just figuring out it's work the way I'm working is working for me right now but when I look 10 to 15 years down the road like having a life that is a little more balanced and is a little bit more manageable that is something I really want and I'm really working on figuring out what that looks like yeah universe if you can yeah, help Julia please. with this <laughs> figure out what that thing looks like yeah yeah so the questions mm-hmm. what is the last meal that you had that made you emotional oh gosh just last night um I took my sous chef and my um cook Irene who's me- Mexican to Cosme <gasps> Ooh. and it was fantastic it's Irene's first time in New York um and obviously she has a lot in common with Daniela and Isabel over at Cosme mm-hmm. so it was emotional because the food was really wonderful but also just to like share that dinner with her was so great oh that's such a lovely thing yeah. what's your comfort food Oh, sugar. I have a, like such a bad. <laughs> <laughs> is there a particular format? Is like um, ice cream or candy? Our or? pastry chef, Caitlin, you know, she is just constantly putting something out and usually it's cake. <laughs> oh, cake. What is your dream cake? Oh, she makes um, like anything with cream cheese frosting, Ooh. carrot cake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. I kind of want that right this yeah. second. <laughs> what is the last meal that somebody made for you at their home? Oh, um, the man I am seeing made me uh, some really delicious Thai curry. <laughs> Ooh, that's lovely. He's not a chef. <laughs> okay. I mean, <laughs> that's the thing is like people are always like, nobody cooks for me. So I'm yeah. really glad that somebody yeah. cooked for you. Yes. That's like, an amazing thing. Like yeah. shout out to her for that. That's incredible. Yeah. Who is the, and this is actually challenge, might be a challenging question for you because of where you live. Who is the living musician who you would most want to cook for and what would you cook for them? Mm. I mean, Dolly. Like <laughs> You're not the only person who has said Dolly. Right. I think you might be the third person. Well, we cook for musicians all the time. That's, That's what true. I'm thinking. Like, we recently did an event uh, with Little Big Town. Casey Musgraves <gasps> have been in our restaurant okay. twice in the last week. I've just started listening <laughs> to Casey Musgraves. I'm in so much love. Yeah, I mean, that is Nashville, right? Yeah. But um, but you rarely catch a, a glimpse of Dolly or Reba or any of the greats. Oh. And so when you do, like, that's something that's really special. What would you make for Dolly? Oh, gosh, anything she wanted. <laughs> <laughs> Presumably Southern food, but who knows? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I, I can't even imagine. I saw her in concert once, and it was one of the most magical nights of my life. Yeah. And, okay, let's say you have five uninterrupted minutes for self-care. What do you do? Ooh, um, like in reality? <laughs> or what, yeah, or like what? what is your thing? Or, or you can even say, like, what is the thing you wish you could do for five minutes? I usually foam roll. Do you know about foam rolling? <gasps> okay, talk to me about this because my colleague is so into that these days. Okay, so self, it's a form of self-massage and you just get this foam cylinder that um, you can really easy techniques for rolling out your calves and the backs of your legs and even your IT band that just like when you stand on your feet Mm -hmm. all day kind of releases you in a way that feels so amazing and you can do it in a short amount of time it is super painful when you start oh yeah but the more you do it the more you get used to it it's like the most soothing thing so five minutes of of foam rolling yeah 
Yeah, that is good. Great. It is. And I hope you get to do that after your amazing ride, after we have raised you so much money. Yeah. And you have raised that for the yeah, kids. And thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thanks here. for having me. Oh, my gosh. Thank you to our guest today, Juliet Sullivan. And you can people can find you on social. At Julia Keelan. K E E L I N. Oh, and, lovely. And at Henrietta underscore red. Okay. Please, please visit Henrietta Red next time you're in Nashville picking up a, a, a show. Thank you to our producers, Jennifer Martnick, Alicia Cabral, and Amy Frank. Thanks to Douglas Wagner for our delightful theme song. If you like what you heard, please tell a friend, write a review, or rate us. If there is something you would like for us to talk about or a guest you'd like to hear from, please let us know. You can find me on Twitter at Kitten with a Whip. Find out more about the show and catch up on all the episodes at foodandwine.com and Food and Wine's YouTube page. Thank you for listening and take good care of yourself until the next time. Bye.